Friends, pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations that are on all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. So when I'm attending a social event, I, I don't always let people know I'm an ordained minister right away. Because I'd like them to just get to know me as a human being first. And, and then we go from there because what, what often happens is uh, if people know I'm the pastor, they'll say, oh, you know, here's why I don't believe in God. Or here's why I don't go to church. It's like, well, nice to meet you too. You know, <laughs> somehow, you know, as a, as a pastor, you sort of embody or the face of the church and of, and of God. And, and, and the reality is, as I listen, you know, people have some really important reasons to say that. They share their stories of a tragic death. Or they talk about hearing on the news of all the people who have been killed in Gaza or Darfur. And they say, where is God? How can there be a world like this and a good God? Or perhaps their church has hurt them, refused them communion when they went through a divorce, or there was lots of toxic fighting or the sheltering of a predator. And, you know, I'm sympathetic 100% with everything they have to say. And, and I really believe if we write off people's laments about God and church, then, then we really don't have anything to offer. We have to face into this together. So that's my two-part sermon series here on humbler faith, bigger God. Because I think these are the attitudes we need. Sometimes we need a little more humility and less certainty as we face into questions and challenges. And, and second, let's not put God in a box and limit what God can do and be ready to have this lifelong unfolding of how we understand God, the mystery and awe and even the frustration and questions that sometimes go with that journey. And then next week, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the failings of Christianity and how we address that. But I, I, I chose Romans 12 as my text because I think Paul has this mixture of realism, but also extraordinary hope. Paul was very realistic about our struggles and our afflictions and injustice. These things happen more often than we would like. And, and Paul speaks to the reality of evil three times in this passage. We don't know all the circumstances that he was addressing in this letter, but we do know that there were persecutions by the empire of the Roman church. And we know Paul himself faced many hardships on his many preaching journeys. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten by a mob. He was jailed or imprisoned at least twice. He had a physical infirmity that he called his thorn in the flesh. But he didn't see these hardships and injustices as things that were brought about by God as, as signs or, or punishment or reasons to doubt God's existence. The truth is, having faith in God is not an insurance policy. It doesn't inoculate us from hardship. That as we join a church, we're not a club of the fortunate who has no hardships or challenges or sickness or danger. Jesus said the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. Sometimes even in the Psalms, we read these laments. How can it be that good people suffer and wicked people seem to prosper? 
Life's not fair. How can that be? And the best answer that biblical wisdom can sometimes give us is cause and effect just take a very long time to play out. Like Dr. King said, the, the great arc of history, it, it's long, but it does bend towards justice, but it's hard to wait in the moment. Yet still, God is with us. And we're loved and not forgotten. And if God is with us, then we can find the strength and courage and peace of mind to meet the moment with faith and hope and love. And I think what else Paul makes clear is we cannot do this alone. We need community, church. We're not just Christians by ourselves. And he says that we, we go out and we weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. Later in Romans, he says, you know, if just one part of your body suffers, your whole body suffers, right? If one person in the church is suffering, it affects all of us to some degree. And yet, too often when we see suffering, we move away from it instead of towards it. Sometimes we act like grief is contagious, like we might catch it. Maybe we need a mask around people who are suffering so that we don't breathe it in, and then we too will end up grieving. We were, we were talking about this at a pastor's meeting this week, and one of my colleagues is deeply grieving the sudden death of her husband. And in the midst of that, she's a pastor that's not far from Lewiston, Maine, where the mass shooting happened, and she's been trying to support her community and dealing with all of her own grief. And, and she said that one of the hardest things about grief and suffering is the feeling of being deeply alone because other people don't necessarily understand or experience the depth of grief that she's going through. And she said the worst is like the platitudes, the things that people say that don't really mean very much. But, but she said, here's the best thing that someone says to me. A good friend says to her regularly, how is your grief today? How is your grief today? It acknowledges the reality that, that grief is there. There's no pressure to say, I'm doing well or I'm doing okay, but, but you can say, this is what's going on with me today. I'm hanging in there, but yeah, thanks for asking. My, my grief is real. So often when we encounter a disaster or a tragedy or injustice, it, it, strips, it strips away the mundane. It reveals our vulnerability, but it also calls forth our courage. And when I see news coverage of, of disasters, I cringe. I, I tend to turn them off. Sometimes it's just too much. But it's also the way they're covered that, that you see all of the, you know, you see a home that is smashed to splinters. Or there's a child's toy bear sitting in a pile of rubble. Or somebody's car is floating down the road and they're on it trying to stay above the flood. And we see these things and then the cameras move on. We don't know what happens to anyone. We don't hear how the community might be resilient or come together or help one another. We just see the disaster and isn't it awful? So I wanna tell a story about my hometown. And later Holly's gonna talk a little bit about what's happened here to give a different side of this. So I grew up knowing to watch the sky and discern its changes. You see, my father was a pilot 
and he came from a family of farmers. So when we talk about the weather, it's serious business. And growing up on the flat, dry prairie out in central Iowa, it was the perfect place for tornadoes to form. We were part of what they called Tornado Alley. And I knew from a young age, you saw the funnel cloud, you headed to the basement or the bathtub or a ditch or wherever you could go to be safe as you could. So I was 12 years old. I'm waiting for a ride from baseball practice. And you know, clouds usually move west to east, right? And I'm watching the clouds and they're, they're circling me. I think this is not a good thing. And, and as we're driving home, I see the first little funnel cloud on the horizon and, and we're dashing around the farm, we're getting the animals in the barn and locking doors and trying to get everything so it won't be flying away. Like you could stop a tornado, right? And by the time we were done, I could count six funnel clouds in every direction. So, you know, we had to kind of watch everywhere all at once. And then it came. At first it was so still. It's the irony of, of tornadoes. It sucks everything out of the air like a big vacuum. It's like the dust, the moisture, the oxygen. It's, it's like being inside of a vacuum. And, and in some ways it's so beautiful. This this staggering, malevolent beauty almost across the plains. And then this, this funnel cloud comes down out of the sky like this giant finger. I later learned that the Jordan tornado was an F5. That's the highest category of tornadoes. And it was nearly a mile wide at the base. Two funnel clouds had come together. They were rotating in opposite directions. Nobody knew that was even possible. And it went like a giant rototiller right down the fertile Iowa fields. It, and, and, and my mother's calling me to come down in the basement, and I'm, I'm 12, so you know I'm going to do what I'm going to do, right? But I felt compelled to watch, like to just bear witness. It was, it was like, you know, Moses and the Ten Commandments and one of the plagues almost coming out of the sky. And, and the twister touches down outside this little town called Jordan, Iowa, close to my home. Jordan, typical Iowa town, 20 houses, a church, a gas station, a school, six bars. That seems to be the right, you know, sort of how it how it worked. And this, and this big grain elevator, you know, a grain elevator is about a 10 story building that you know you can contain a lot of corn or soybeans or whatever in it. And it's, that's the biggest thing, really the only thing that's on the horizon. And, and I watched the cloud move towards it and it's, even from a distance I can see it's throwing up dirt and trees and telephone poles, tractor trailers, a cow. It's just going through and it, and it comes over the town of Jordan, engulfs the elevator, and it, as it passes by, the elevator's gone. And, and you know, if you know how flat an Iowa horizon is, to take something off the horizon, it's just it's completely bare and empty. And, and I'm watching for 10 minutes that felt like an eternity as it's moving closer to where we are. And then suddenly, for no reason, it just lifts up into the sky and it goes away. It's over. I'd prayed for friends that were in the path. And as the danger passed, we all came out of our shelters and we thought of our neighbors, and everybody came out 
to, to help. And, and the scene that we saw was just so surreal. You know, when there's destruction like that, there's, there's no logical pattern. There's no moral arc of what happens. You know, we go by one house and it was entirely wiped out except there was one corner of the house left. And in the corner, somebody had this teacup collection. And there's still this fragile little teacup collection is hanging on the hooks and the rest of the house is gone. How does that happen? There were kind-hearted, hard-working people who lost everything. And there were some folks who were, you know, not so nice and hard to deal with, and they were spared. Why? We don't know. Surely we were no great sinners than the people over in the next county. And, you know, I have no patience with preachers who say that natural disasters are, you know, God's judgment on people. How would they know that? Why did it happen? It happened because there was a warm air mass and a cold air mass that collided together, created the biggest funnel cloud that we had recorded in history. And we were in the way. But this, this destructive tornado created the most powerful experience for me of what a community can do. You know, minutes after the tornado lifted, there were hundreds of us that had rushed out into the disaster area around Jordan, and we arrived at a home of some folks we know who were church members. And we thought we were there pretty fast, but there were already people there, and they had sheets of plastic out and staple guns, and were covering over the windows from the wind and the rain, and there were already two pies in a casserole. And I thought, and, and these are people that I had, you know, I'm 12, right? These are adults that sit in church, and they sing, and they do whatever, you know, just church folks. And I thought, who are these people? who have pies, ready for a disaster. Like, <laughs> there was no time to make a casserole. How did they get there? Who are these people with staple guns and plastic? And they were there when it was most needed. And people are sweeping up the broken dishes. And, and you know, since I'm young and I was fairly fast, I was in track, and they sent me out on a team to find the cattle. Because the cows just went crazy. And, and you know, all the fences are down and they were miles away and they sent those of us out who could run to go out and, you know, calm them down and, and start to bring the herd back. And, you know, at the end of the day, there was so much mud. I was up to my, above my knees in mud. I was exhausted, but I was also exhilarated to be a part of something. You know, to, to really face into such a great destructive tragedy and yet feel like together we can face this. We can make it better. We can, we can deal with some of the destructiveness. And my youth group spent the next week getting debris out of the field so that they could be replanted the next year. And it just seemed like this National Guard just came out of the woodwork, right? Like we weren't in the National Guard. We just became it. Just people just came out and they helped. And we did the best we could to overcome. I later came across this wonderful book by Rebecca Solnit titled, A Paradise Built in Hell. The Extraordinary Communities That Come Out of Disaster. And she writes about several natural disasters, even the 1906 earthquake in California and up to Hurricane Katrina. And she's fascinated by the stories of compassion and bravery and community action that, you know, so often we see there's a disaster and, oh, people are looting and they're selfish and so on. And they're just, it makes people look like they're powerless. But what she found is Many communities that experience disaster come together 
and they rebuild and try to make their communities better. I think that's what happens. You know, I think um, Holly and Peggy were a part of that when we had those murders here. And, and sometimes our best comes out. And she writes that our disaster response gives us nothing less than a glimpse of who else we ourselves may be and what our society could become. That not everybody just drives by. They stop. They help. And I think witnessing my community's resilience in the face of disaster, I think it really influenced my path towards ordained ministry. It, it taught me that true leadership in a church isn't just preaching doctrine, although obviously I think preaching is pretty important, but it's also embodying compassion. It's creating this readiness to bear the burden of our grief, our loss, the times of tragedy and evil among us. As Paul so eloquently put it, we rejoice with those who rejoice, but we stop, we weep with those who weep. And also do not overcome, be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. To be that staple gun ready community, committed to dignity and peace and compassion. So when people ask in the midst of a disaster or evil, and they say, where is God in the midst of this? How could God let this happen? We're already getting out the plastic. The casseroles are warming and getting ready to deliver. But also in the aftermath of it, we're organizing. Perhaps advocating for better laws and better legislation. Rebuilding and healing. Amen.